And these were some that since I got the wood stove going for the winter, I decided to try heat coating them. They were partially coated, but mostly just at the top still where they were not in the salt water. Most of the coating had come off from making previous cans. I think it's kind of evidence, kind of hard to see on there because the light. I think where they're darker is where the um, caustic coating remained on, which seems harder to burn off than when you just heat, heat treat them, heat coat them. Are you putting the temperature pretty high? It's it was, and it kept coming off, and then I moved to just uh, setting them on top of the stove, which is about like a simmer to medium heat. Yeah, there you, you go. have on your stove, on a regular stove. Yeah. Just let me sort of announce here that this is the Keshe Plasma Reactor Group for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015, and we're just kind of getting into things here, so... Anybody uh, tunes in, that's what we're doing. Okay, Jamie, uh, go ahead there, just carry on if you have something there. This is a steel plate. A steel plate? That I, yep, that I've been trying to nano coat. I never had much luck with the caustic of it turning black. It seemed to work better with the heat treating to turn it black than it did. I mean, it's still got some rust color to it, but it seemed to work more efficiently than um, the caustic coating for getting a black finish on it. Yeah, black's tricky with uh, iron. There's iron oxide that's black and iron oxide that's the tr traditional red rust color. And it tends to go red before it goes black. Well, it's harder to get the black. But they do use a black coating now on many tools. You'll see black, um, tools now uh they call the is it i don't know some kind of black finish the special finish they call it but it's um it's an iron oxide process and it gives that black coating and it uh it's, it's pretty durable actually but it has to be done properly and i noticed it was coming off in my hands and as a mechanic that was a problem and it was causing irritation to my hands so um I actually wrote away to the tool manufacturers and suggested they didn't use the black oxide coating. But of course, now, two or three years later, they're all black oxide, I've noticed. Anyway, it's interesting. It's, um, do, you know what, do you know what their coating process is to get a oxide? No, I'm not clear. Um, there are different sort of plasma processes that are used where they stream in some nitrogen or argon and blast it with carbon and uh, and so on to try to um, produce a, a finish on it and uh, they may use a flame process actually there's there's a process they use that way to produce the oxide so but it's it's um, stabilized is the thing and so it doesn't turn rusty because that's the worst thing you want is tools that turn rusty Rusty being in terms of the traditional rust color. Right. I'm not sure what my material's composed of either. It was a uh, flashing, but it's not galvanized, I don't believe. I think it was a uh, steel with some kind of. Well, if it was flashing, it, maybe it was zinc. Would it be a it's zinc? It's definitely not zinc. It's very hard. Oh, you okay. know, for as thin as it is, it's half half as thin as the copper and it's very hard twice hard. as stiff okay what about aluminum could it be aluminum no it's yeah. it's very stiff okay i have a piece of it somewhere i'll have to look i think i left the label on one so i could look back i just at the time i decided that was as close to iron as i could have for manageable cutting plates to make gans and it made what looked like CH3 GANs at the time, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Are you doing any coil winding these days or no? Well, we're all up in the air on that, but yeah, I've wound some. Did you wind them the right way or the left way? Right. <laughs> That's, a, <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> it is. I've, we've, I've gone through this for a long time, and then I, I had a lot of coils that were what I thought was one way and retired them all to the pile and thought maybe I'd make gams out of them later and... I have plenty of coils, that's for sure, but I haven't made any full sets of anything until I guess uh, later on this morning we'll find out. Or just go through with it and make them all the same. And I, the only question to me is if um, all the connections will be the opposite. All right. The way we stick the first wire through the inner loop mm -hmm. and then connect it to the next and then counterclockwise and clockwise from there. Right. I'm assuming would just be the flip flop of what everything was explained before. Once we know whatever's clockwise. <laughs> I, yeah. I ended up scrapping my first batch of uh, wrong, wrong direction coils. How do you know they're wrong? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I watched all of the what everybody else was doing and what the directions show. Definitely wrong. My interpretation of what anti-clockwise was uh, uh, confused, let me put it that way. Well, I had my mind pretty set until I looked at uh, now user NA on uh, Facebook was telling everybody that what everybody's been doing was the opposite and he has results. So he, his system is up and running and he's says he's getting quite a DC load, so. Well, I thought that uh, this was cleared up yesterday, that uh, it's only about the keeping everything the same. Yes, I think that's correct. Are you saying, are you saying then that uh, uh, the wrong way coils can be used? Yeah, there may be no as wrong as you way. you don't mix the clockwise and counterclockwise. Right. Just like on Ghostbusters, don't mix the streams. Okay, good. So uh, it's kind of a uh, save, saving grace for us in a way, if that is the case, because a lot of people would have them one way and others have it the other way. And maybe we can all be happy if there's only a, a slight difference, if any, in the efficiency, then uh, well, it's not really important. About if we're, if we're, um, sorry, it's getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, I'm not sure here where that's coming from. I think it's Jamie's mic. Could be. <coughs> okay, that's better. Um, let's cool this down, sorry. Uh, there, that's better. I was going to say, if we're dealing with a flow, okay, we're, we're, we think about the wires, but we have to think about the plasma flow. And we're dictating that already when we hook the live wire up. So we're dictating the flow already. So does the actual coiling matter? Or are we just looking for that flow? Now, according to Mr. Keshla yesterday, we're just looking for the flow. We've been caught up in the matter so much that we're thinking about, oh, if we're winded this way or winded that way. But uh, it's the flow of it. And if we have a interference as in you're winding your clockwise coil and you say oh i shouldn't be doing this and i should be doing a counterclockwise coil and you put them two together then you have a difference in flow sound right it makes sense to me yep So was, was his coils or was his reactor uh, working? The one that did it backwards? You mean now user? Whatever his name was, yeah. It was working, he showed it working. Yeah, there's pictures on Facebook. What do you mean he by- shows the amount of, uh, of resistive load that he puts on the system. Really, nice. 
What's what's his name? Is he here? Or is he over in China? Where is he? His name is now a user, but I I'm not sure, but I think that's somebody that we've uh, had on here before a few times and actually taught. Is that right? Rick, do you know who now a user now is? Now user, I don't recall now user. There was some name like that, though. Maybe it was now user. I, th um, I, I think it's Nicholas Chua. I think. Okay. I can't, I can't be sure on that because I'm not sure. But... I know he's been at uh, presentations in Italy. Oh, he has been? At least some of them. When I first uh, started talking to him, he was sent me some pictures from uh, when they first moved. Do we have a um, Facebook page or something we could show? The only thing on his profile says that he's from the internet. <laughs> right. It, it doesn't matter. I just, I was bringing that up as I, I thought that's who it was, but that I could be completely wrong. Okay. He's been around for a while, but he's kind of sporadically active. Right. Exactly. Hey Vince, have you heard anything about, uh, how the uh, units is shipped out on Friday, how, how things are moving? They're moving. Has anybody gotten them? Probably not yet. One of, my contacts, one of my contacts was MIP, uh, bought one in, I think he said June, and he just received an email that his unit has been shipped. Yeah, any, uh, they weren't available in June, but <laughs> the, the systems will uh, have been shipped and they're shipping slowly so we can get a, a, a sense of how customs are going to to handle this. Exactly. How long do you think they'll be hang, hung up in customs? No idea. That's, uh, that's only the only way we can find out is to actually send them. Yeah, so, I understand. So I we, understand. we've sent them and we'll see how they go. Because when when those things arrive, um, I think that they're going to be you're going to be able to do the nano coating with the with the units themselves, which will be a which will be a big deal um, in terms of uh, the process for building these these units. Of course, of course. I also think that uh, um, GAN's production might be made easier too. That's just my thing. Definitely possible. Anybody else? Well, uh, talked to Dave today, and um, he's got to make four hundred thousand units as fast as he possibly can down in Peru. Rick, I put the. Um, the link for now user in there. Thank you. I'm going to check that out. If I remember his write up. Um, he didn't mention anything about doing any conditioning work. He just all of a sudden came on and said, you know, I got all this stuff plugged in. I got two computers and a coffee pot and all of this and that and this and that. And I'm yeah, just out how he pulled that off. We can't actually yeah. say that he hasn't um, gone through it. Uh, we can't. He's just showing that he's able to bring that uh, or have that amount of load on there. But he didn't say anything about conditioning. That's right. So we, yeah. we can't assume that he didn't, right? Well, if he didn't manage to condition it, uh, it means his unit was built three weeks ago and he's uh, two weeks ahead of everybody else. Definitely possible. Yeah, yeah I, I'm kind of surprised that he's able to condition it so quickly too. 
and it's also possible that he has a better understanding of what we're thinking about and uh, he found a quick way to condition. That's true. Is there, uh, am I missing something here? Is there pictures that he has or, or no? In his Facebook? Is that why you gave uh, the link? No, they're on, I think they're on the Golden Age, Golden Age of Gans, if I remember right. Okay. So I won't put his uh, name up really because he probably doesn't need the advertising. Did, uh, did Mr. Kesh say anything about uh, how his meeting went on Monday? I didn't hear today's talk. Uh, no, he only came in briefly in uh, today's teaching. He was busy in meetings and whatnot, and only came in to tell us that he would be talking about this coil issue thing and, and sorting it out for us today. And that uh, was brief, uh, uh, briefly the way Vince was uh, talking about it, which is anyways okay as long as it works, <laughs> which is the as long as it goes with the flow. You can apparently have a flow one way or another way. But you have to you be know, there's, consistent. You know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the the exact number of turns and um, I, I haven't been counting every single turn on, on all my coils, but I, I'm kind of not thinking that that's as important as some other people think. Uh, any comments? <clears throat> well, Mr. Kesh doesn't seem to think it's as important as some people think because uh, he was giving a range of the coils like it was at one point I think I've heard everywhere between 160 170 180 for the larger one and somewhere between 60 70 for the smaller one is that yeah that, that sounds right so yeah, I think it, it it occurs to me that as, as long as it's within the ratio of two to one you should be pretty close that that's that was my feeling too and then there's talk about, well, it should be in multiples of nine. So there should be multiples of nine coils for the small one and multiples of nine coils for the big one. So you get uh, yeah, different no numbers, like, um, um, well, nine eights would be 72 and then um, 144. I think yeah, the first four, blueprint four. said 81 and 162. Right. Well, that would be a good, that would be a good number in terms of nines and nine times nine and nine times nine times two. But the first day of uh, teachings on what last Monday, uh, I believe the range was 70 to 80 and 150 to 160. Right. You know, it all almost occurs to me when I'm thinking about the this the the like the times nine the ratios and all of that is there these guys are still thinking in vibrational state. Right. Um, You're still thinking that, like that uh, strikes me as as they're thinking in harmonics is in resonance and right. uh, I don't think the system works in a resonance. Right. It's back to electron thinking that way and uh, yeah, all, all I, the I think formulas. I think it's most important. And, you know, Mr. Kesh has even alluded to it, Ralph Ring talked about it, and Lorenzo's talked about it, is that when we make our coils and our GANs, it's, we're putting our energy uh, with our thoughts and our, our feelings into the coils, which I think is much more important than the ratios at this point in time. Um, and maybe, maybe it's a, it's a combination of things, but uh, I think it's all about, you know, putting our feelings and emotions into, you know, the whole building cycle. 
And as they're going along the cycle, uh, the right thought, the right, you know, attitude, uh, the right emotions, uh, those are the keys. You know, we also got people that are trying to squeeze out an extra 5%. You know, I want this, you know, what's the, what's the most efficient I can make this? You're already working with a device that's going to give you more power than you could possibly use anyway. What's the point? Well, I beg to differ when it comes to nines. I believe that nines are, are, are much more divine and there hasn't been uh, enough studies that have been done on them. The nines represent also geometrical shapes and no matter what way an electron looks, the geometrical shape dictates the field flow. So if you've got four corners that are at 90 degree angles, they're not the same as nines or operating in base nine math. Now, I do believe that <clears throat> if you're going to talk about the, a cascading effect, it's not gonna come with not focusing on nines. And if it is, it will be inefficient. So um, to only be short-sighted and look at the nines as, as far as just electrons, then that means that we, we have to think about doing our studies more because nines have much more significant uh, value than just an electron. Well, when we're dealing with an expanding and a collapsing system, uh, the expansive side, the, the most efficient uh, shape that's going to occur on an expansive side is a sphere. The most ex no, efficient. The, the yes. most efficient. So the most efficient geometrical shape is going to be an egg. And not in not in an and not in a balanced expansive system. It's going to be a sphere. Well, it's are you saying that the are you saying that the planets are not shaped like eggs and they're shaped like spheres? The only reason they're they're not absolutely spherical is that they're spinning and their centrifugal force pulling the equator out. Either way that goes, that's still the geometrical shape. You can't null and void the shape just because you like to hear the name spheres. The spheres are based on base nine math. Please don't insult me. There's no need for that. Oh, I'm when not. You're, when you're looking at a radiating field from a singular point and all, all elements of that field are equal, it's radiating, radiating in a sphere. There's no other shape it can be. But in a collapsing system, it must be the smallest volume shape, which is a tetrahedron, which is four points, uh, six sides, there's no nine involved. I'm, I'm not saying nine is not important. I'm saying that it doesn't equate to what we're doing here, or at that's, least it doesn't directly equate to what we're doing. That's, it, that's, your interpretation of, that's your interpretation of your education. Now, what I'm saying to you is that nines absolutely factor into this. Now, a, a, another thing that I would like to add is that if the planets are oval shaped, you want me to stop looking at the things that I see you want me to lock, stop looking at the shapes that I see that's in nature and pay attention to a geometrical shape that is of basically a, a, an equation. I look at nature and I focus on nature and nature tells me that I don't see perfect spheres. We only see ovals. So the, the tetrahedron is, is, a, is a, what can I say? It's a construct a bit, yeah? And you're using those lines in a, in, a, in the wrong geometrical patterns because there are no straight lines or no 90 degree angles. The planet and the universe uses uh, um, vortexes, okay? So to, you, and nowhere in a vortex will you, are you going to get a, a perfect sphere. So why would I pay attention to it? It's the Taurus, the Taurus. The Taurus shape. Do you hear, did you hear about the vortex math? with a uh, rolling toil, for example. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? Did I hear about the what? You hear me? Hello, uh, hello. Yes, I hear you. Me? Yes, Annabelle, yes. yes, go ahead. Hey, hi everybody, this is Anibal. Uh, no, I was saying that if you, if, you, uh, uh, if you know something about vortex math, uh, for example, the rolling coil, is based on uh, vortex mass, and they use the torus as a shape. Um, and the, the number nine is crucial. Uh, they divide this, uh, this torus in nine parts. And uh, that's, that's the, <clears throat> the point, uh, let's say, the, I don't know the word, we can use the, 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 the plasma field or the etheric field for them, where the energy comes from back and forth to this uh, material world or physical world. 
and they use this coil with the shape of a torus, a donut. Uh, that's that's what I'm trying to share. It's not a spherical nor oval. It's a, it's a torus, and uh, and they divide it in nine parts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the uh, does the planet look like a donut, or any planets that look like donuts? No, but if you see the fields of the Earth, uh, it, it, they emanate from the North Pole and come back for the to the South Pole, and they they create a torus. It's a torus field. Animal. Well, no. actually, in theory, maybe it is, but it, it's actually not that shape at all. When you look at it, it looks more like a spider than a torus because of the push of the solar um, wind and so on. It totally distorts the Earth's magnetic field. It's not much like a, a, a perfect uh, torus as far as that goes. Uh, it's not like a oh, magnet with, with uh, in and out, you know, that's exact and so on. It's, it goes way out into the I would say the vortex ma uh, math uh, basically uh, describes more along the lines of the field structure and not the actual fields themselves, like what you're talking about, Rick. Yeah, well, that's the thing we need to spe specify if we're talking about the physicality, which is like the shape of something that we see, as opposed to the fields of that thing. And that goes probably for humans as well But there's nothing well to say that the, uh, the, the vortex-based math, based on the fields, cannot end up with the matter on the in the end. But that doesn't describe the structure of that matter in the end. Well, You're right, yes. Okay, the only point that I was making is that I'm thinking that it's a little bit short-sighted when we're looking at uh, baseline math and, and boxing it in and saying something like uh, it's only looking at electrons. That, that basically, because this leads into religion. It also leads into uh, um, travel, space travel, all right? And there are several coils, not just the rodent coil, the ad hoc coil, corrected some of the, the flaws that were in the rodent coil. And there was another coil that was after that. I can't remember the name of it, uh, a few. And they didn't use the completely vortex map. They yeah, combined them. There was a the coil after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, look, we can get into the, the baseline math, and I, I wouldn't mind teaching you guys all about it. But what I can tell you, it is very short-sighted to think about it just in electrons. We also did discuss this on Monday, I believe. Did we not, Rick? I think a whole class in the afternoon was devoted to the the angles and and um, the power of nine, or what what he was talking about. Uh, yeah, it was so, towards so, so three do you think and nine. That maybe, and so on. You know, if you're counting a uh, hundred and eighty one um, coils, do you think it's not going to work at one hundred and eighty three, or it's going to be um, significantly less? Shouldn't it be a hundred? Should it be one hundred eighty? We're talking about now. One hundred eighty, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now this this is what I'll say to you guys as far as that's concerned. I'm looking for the cascading effect, and I'm trying to use the geometrical shapes that I create in order to create that, so that I don't have to add things onto it. it. If we're looking for a cascading effect and we can't get it out of our coils, it's probably because our coiling is inefficient. All right. So we need to delve more into that. Now I'm I don't gonna, care. I'm gonna say it's probably our thoughts that are, are incorrect versus the coiling. Well, aren't they one and the same? When you release your fields, are you not releasing your thoughts as a plasmatic field? And their geometrical shape, if it's correct, would last longer? Is that not what we yeah. see in the construct yes. that we look at? Yeah, yes. that's that's correct. So if that is the case, then what I'm saying is geometrical is going to break down the baseline map. I release my thoughts in a geometrical baseline math uh, uh, configuration. And I'm saying that the coils have to be also thought about that. I thought about making them smaller, to be honest with you. I I'm, thought about, with you. I'm with you. I'm with you now. I thought about what, what, we, what we really want to do is we want to uh, maybe reduce the, uh, the center coils and have a cascading effect of those coils in like a wine glass kind of a, a, a configuration using baseline math. That was my first thought when I saw the three consensual coils. Well, why not make this, this, the bottom one the smallest one so it looks like a martini glass or in that, in that fashion? Yeah, I, I think, Khalil, what, you're, what we're all dealing with now is we're going to find out that 
this technology is is a lot bigger than what we're starting off with with our simple coil. Um, it's going to evolve and it's going to evolve into um, a lot of different smart people coming to the table and and offering a lot of new smart ideas. And uh, this is kind of what it's all about. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, your thoughts are, are, are heading in the right direction. You know, you need everybody and every student needs to be uh, open to um, ideas and inspirations and, and put them forward. Rick, I wanted to ask you and uh, Vince a question about the cascading effect that I was talking about with the three coils, on which we made the bottom one smaller. What did you guys think about that? Uh, open to um, ideas and inspirations and, and put them forward. Rick, I wanted to ask you and uh, Vince a question about the cascading effect that I was talking about with the three. Okay. That was fun. Okay. I didn't understand that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing that Moran brought up, I asked him sort of an offhand question about the three coils. And uh, the one word he used within that explanation was balance. So if we have a smaller coil at the bottom, we're actually introducing an imbalance into that, into that uh, what is eventually gonna wind up, I would assume to be a toroidal field. But I'm, I'm also looking at this from as many points of view and as many angles as I possibly can um, with my own understanding. And um, he did stress balance. Well, yeah. one of the things that what Dr. Walter Russell talks about also is balance, logarithmic balance. Okay, now, um, if we were looking at the fields, remember the matter doesn't matter at all. Okay, so the configurations uh, for the actual copper doesn't matter. We're looking at how we are generating and creating the fields and the geometrical shape of the fields that we're creating. Right. So if, if we're doing that, then I'm saying that the logarithmic Balance is probably going to come with the sh with the with the the shapes. I'm going to get very technical with this, where I, even the the length of the coils will be based on base nine math, as well as the circumference of the outer side of the outside coil to the inside coil. I think all of that improves the efficiency because when I played with those rotating coils before and the ab hop coils, there was it was small little tweaks that jumped from uh, you know. Uh, maybe 70% efficiency to 150. And it was something very simple, the, the uh, adjustments on those things, yeah? And they are like fingerprints. So each one of them have their own uh, individual personalities. I think that the mm -hmm. coils are, are the same way. Well, that, that's, yeah. that's really a function of resonance. And if you look at any musical theory, if you're out just a little tiny bit, you lose the resonance. So yeah, I, I, I can totally understand with the rodent coils and the others, where you're dealing with resonance that matters massively. But I don't see a resonance factor within this system, at least not yet, anyway. Okay, so we have to step down that plasma, right? We have to step it down because when it when, it, nope. when the coil's created- First you have okay. to create it, so- Create it. What, where's right. the plasma that you're creating? Where is it exactly? It's coming from the coils, which no. I configured. No, it's coming from the GANs. The coils are only picking it up. The, the nano coating on the coils is a wire for the plasma. It's a way for us to direct its flow. That's it, that's all it does. Well, all right, so my point is this. If we're stepping down the plasma, okay, then um, the, signal down the, that the signal that's coming into the house is basically like a frequency also. And Kesh said that you needed a, you needed a signal. That's all you needed, right? To use it for the conventional products that we have now, yes. Okay, the so they're designed around fifty cycles or sixty cycles per second. So yeah, yeah, I could see that would be necessary. Certainly. Well, but the way the, I the, look at it is the signal is to uh, to uh, initiate the the plasma. In this case, it's the signal goes yeah. into the core, which. Uh, or produces the plasmatic um, inter you know field in between yeah, the coils. Yeah, but the step the stepping down to electron uh, vibration energy is a stopgap measure. In two years, we're not even going to have electricity. We won't need it. I agree. I agree with that, hundred percent. 
but I'm only talking about how we configure these coils to be as efficient as possible so that we, we maybe leapfrog around some of the stuff that we're going to have uh, with this winding and uh, who do you, you know, these guys were throwing their coils on a barbecue pit today, eh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's the thing about yeah, it is, is it, it, this stuff has been done for thousands and thousands of years. We've got evidence that that the 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 uh, pre pyramid civilizations had this technology, so it's well, they easy. did. Everybody can do it. They did, and in America, in New Hampshire, they have Stonehenge as well as the mounds that are all over the Americas. Okay, mm -hmm. and. When you go down to uh, to South Africa, Michael Tellinger did a very good job of producing uh, what he called musical stones. They had a patina on them, which I believe is just a nano coating. And they used the nano coating and the resonance from the nano coating to create those tones. So uh, once again, I think we're going back to just a signal. And that's what I mean by stepping the plasma down. I'm, I'm giving the intention. like. If, if it was in alchemy, I, and you need to seed the stone with a little bit of gold. So I, I'm saying that the signal is, is acting as the same way. It's the intention. I'm, this is what I want out of the plasma and I'm putting my intention into it in different stages to step it down for what I want. Eventually we won't need it. Awesome, I, I'm looking forward to your results. Any but uh, Molly, I think that the, the, other than the shape itself of the coils and the relationship of the number of turns, uh, I think that the critical part, really, really critical part here, is the quality of the nano coating. Uh, just we need to be absolutely sure this is not just the color because a carbon coating could be similar to a nano coating, and we need to be very sure that we are getting a nano coding. That's the, the most important part. And I'm really confused about the, the processes because uh, the document released by the, the R&D uh, department of the foundation, which encourages the use of uh, torching, uh, don't match with the experiments that you guys, most of the guys, uh, the knowledge seekers are doing. And also yesterday, Shandor was commenting that uh, the, the 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 torching of the, the the copper will will make it brittle it will crack very easily so I don't get it I think the the original method which is the caustic plus uh, uh, some uh, plastics and maybe some aluminum will work but uh, if we are not hundred percent that the layers are created the efficiency lays there I think that's the the main point we need to discuss or be, well, you know, uh, agree in that. What do they do at the factory might be one question. As far as I know, they use the fire technique there. In the in the coils? You're yeah, talking not, about the coils that uh, the, yeah. the blue box, the blue graphs power? Yeah. yeah. Well, really? I, I think so, because if you try to make a 1,000 or 1 million units, uh, you know, a nano coating with the process of caustic will be really, really slow. Right, so, and it's also uh, more more toxic and I'm, more dangerous and so on as well. So, I'd like to have a I'd like to have a try of mass production because I believe that the fire is is one that we have to. Uh, it's a bit of an artistry, and I believe that. There is a sweet zone that has to do with this. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier today. I was like, you know what? I'm going to use base now math even with the temperature. So I never get it over a certain temperature, you know? And I think that it's an art that comes to it. I've seen several other kind of mass manufacturings and where they heat up things, especially uh, uh, the porcelain. It was one of the reasons on why I thought that cold porcelain would be very good for this uh, for these projects, if not at the very least for um, bringing the children along. So, so, you know, when when we get our first unit working or we get our blue box, um, these units, I believe, will be able to nano coat other units uh, very, very effectively, just like they're going to nano coat the wires in our house. So as we look at mass producing, I think that the plasma technology 
is going to be um, part of our toolbox in, in that new manufacturing cycle. I don't think we're going to have to go through a manufacturing cycle where we're going to take out a blowtorch and, and blowtorch all of these units. No, I was, I was thinking of something uh, along the lines of just in the beginning of production so that we start to produce a huge amount of them. Yeah, Eventually, you should be able to take about 10 blue boxes hooked up in series and hook the coils up to them and just let them nano coat them. Well, one blue box, one blue box. Yeah, okay. Well, I was talking about maybe uh, 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 20,000 coils at one time, but I understand where you're, you're coming from. Yeah, that's correct. Because they're gonna nano coat the wires in our, in our house and they're gonna nano coat the wires in our neighborhoods. You know, maybe this is it's not one, maybe it's two, but uh, you know, you. I think you're going to find that uh, the capabilities of not only this particular generation, but the um, product that's right behind it, the generator, is going to be the solution to the manufacturing cycle for larger quantities. That's my thoughts. Hey, Rick. I was. Rick, mm -hmm. I'd like yeah. to know if you if if you guys know anything about cold porcelain. I, you can do a, a, a screen share, and I can show you guys what I'm talking about as far as that's concerned. If you okay, go ahead. I've never done this before, fellas. So please, I'm really new to a bunch of stuff. If you yeah, click the screen share button, and then you'll get an option of what you want to share. What you want to share needs to already be open. I yeah, pull up the image first. Screen share. I see three three things: a whiteboard, an iPhone, and a desktop. Did you, yeah, um, you need to bring up your have image? What, what you want shared open on on your computer somewhere? Yeah, I do. And, and then it'll come up on that in that box. Well, they're they're actually web pages. So would you be able to see the same thing that I see? Yeah, uh, we're looking we're looking at your screen. Okay, so select if your, if you your just browser want to do your window. Desktop, if you're not worried about showing everybody what your applications are, then you can just do your desktop. Yeah, if you guys can see that, can you see this now? Uh, yeah, yeah, we see your yeah, we see your uh, screen there now. Your browser. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so when you talk about how to make cold porcelain, one of the things that I was thinking about was what Kesh was talking about a while back when he said that the um, ceramics would be probably the best for everything. You know, so um, I, the first thing I did was I did my research on um, transistors. And what I found was that a lot of the high-end transistors use porcelain. So what I was thinking about was how could I incorporate the porcelain into uh, the, the manufacturing of the, the GANs? And my first thought was to make a, an indefinite battery. And I was going to do it by, by incorporating the GANs directly into the cold porcelain. If we go over this cold porcelain, it's very, very beautiful because each one of these ingredients can be changed out. You can change out the corn flour and the cornstarch for whatever you like. That's why I thought that this would be beautiful for the pain pens, because now we can start talking about using the blue-green algae with uh, a mixture of spirulina and uh, these things, and you can make it. I mean, this is completely creative. You can change out almost everything. And it says here that you just take 240 milliliters of cornstarch, uh, 240 milliliters of white glue. That's Elmer's white glue that, that the children use. That's another reason why I wanted to do it, so that they could be introduced into being able to create things that work, like a battery pack for their toys. Uh, the two tablespoons of lemon juice, lime juice or vinegar, and lotion, okay? Uh, it says here that you have one of, two, one of three ways of making it, okay? Now, this is the first way, all right? And that's mixing one cup, 250, 40 milliliters of cornstarch and one cup of white glue. Uh, and you use a microwave bowl, okay? Now, uh, you mix the two tablespoons of baby oil and two tablespoons of lemon juice. The alternatives listed ingredients, you know, I think that you can change this with almost anything. I was even talking to with my group about using battery acid, you know, like, because, I would like to see what that, that battery acid actually holds a charge. And if we can get it in the encasing of, of some coils, what would happen? I really want to play with this in every single facet that I can. So uh, the, this is just something that I came up with. Uh, it says here that you, um, 
Um, the lemon juice is not vital for the consistency, but it's strongly recommended as it, as it inha inhibits the growth of mold. Okay, now we can change that out for a few things like grapeseed oil or, you know, some other kinds of things. I'm, I'm clearly talking about pain pens or, or medical apparatus at this point, not energy. All right. Now, with the energy, I'm, I, I was thinking that the acid can be battery acid. I mean, if we if you got protective gloves on and you're and you're doing it, you, you know, you let the uh, cold porcelain dry. It may be a way of recycling that that shit rather than throwing it down the drain and killing the planet. So that's I just look to try and uh, transmute energy. One of the uh, prophecies said that man would uh, man would evolve when man could transmute. And I am very much an alchemist, so that's where my base is, and that's why when I teach my uh, my group has a lot of Gantz because I recommend to them to go out and scour every piece of metal that you can get and get a Gantz of it. In fact, now, Rick, I think what we've been doing and what we've been talking about is I want to find an old rusty gun and Gantz the shit out of it because nothing says peace like Gantz in those guns. They put a lot of effort into that blue steel that they make for those weapons. I want it as a Gantz. I want to see what happens. So we got an alternative of 15 second intervals in the microwave with more stirring. The microwave, uh, go ahead. I got a question for you. Uh, don't you think that mixing matter with GANs uh, won't uh, weaken the effectiveness of the GANs? I, I think it will. What I was thinking about was I was going to follow the same processes that Kesh did, right? Where we, we put a pure GANs around the system itself, but um, I can encase that in you know, a myriad of other different kind of ganses. And basically what I'm trying to do is just create as many, um, what is, what is, uh, uh, what is he, what do we call, gradients as possible. So, or, or, or it's about the conditions. So I'm just following that if I, if I set in motion certain conditions, what am I going to get out of it? So that, that's really what I'm looking at. I mean, when you're talking about the cold porcelain, you could actually mold the cold porcelain and inject a, a, a line of pure gants around it and let it dry. It's not going to go anywhere. You know, that, that's the point about this, yeah? Now, I mean, Khalil? Did you hear uh, Mr. Kesh's talk um, earlier on, probably in some of the classes, about the, um, uh, the, the possibility to um, put together three or four different types of substances to create one GANS and how that, uh, how that happens, you know, with the, um, with the, um, CO2 container, uh, the newer ones have the six sides to them. Yeah. And you can take um, all of these components and, you know, a lemon, uh, oil, whatever, and, and um, have them create GANs um, by having another uh, um, nano coated. Um, Thing on the op opposite side of it, and you can do it all together into one into one soup, if you will. As a matter of yeah. fact, we talked about this GAN soup. That's kind of how it's how it's being done. And all of these things, and I know you're doing a lot of the, the the different GANs. You can combine a lot of them to create, um, you know, the one you know one bigger GANs that is something that uh, you know nobody has ever um, come up with before. They may have properties that are unlike anything else that's ever been seen. That's that's what I'm trying to 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 uh, do by having people all over the countries nano coding. I mean, gansing all different kinds of metals. You know, we were talking the other day about one guy called in on the radio, and he was talking about a type of metal that's inside of dryers that he retrieves all the time. I guess it's I'm not really sure what it is. I told him to remove it and gans it. Let's see what it is when you remove it again. Yeah, maybe there, it must be a chrome. Probably the nickel chromium heating element. Um, as far as I know, chromium is really hard to nanocoat. He called it something like, uh, oh man, I don't know. Is this public? Well, tungsten, tungsten. Could be tungsten. 
Well, we already started with the tungsten welding rods and, and shout out to Rick, cause I thought that jewel from him, you know, like I ran right with it. As soon as he, put, he threw it out there, I said, go get some tungsten welding rods as much as you can. But I've got people that, are, that, ha that can actually operate the CNC machines. So there's a lot of different uh, metals that, that, that come from there. Um, we're, we're, we're getting the gas of carbide bits, everything that you can think of, as long as it's a, a alloy, I told them to gans it. And I think that when we combine them together, you know, we're going to get some, something is going to happen. I even got these guys that are, that are doing silver. So, so remember, so remember the, um, the coil and what you're trying to do is, is the atomic number, um, that you're really watching for. So these ones that have the higher strength, you're going, if you can think of it, is you're going deeper into the coil uh, and pulling out uh, more possibilities, if you will. So things like, like the higher, yeah. higher strength metals like tungsten, um, that's the direction to go. Correct. Uh, now, you, you make, you the, make the gas in the palm. With a regular method and the nano coated copper plate and and the salt water is that the way you create the, these GANs of other other metal? Uh, yeah, we're we're creating the GANs from just the uh, nano coated wires, but we're start. This is another thing that we started doing today. We were hanging plastic bags with a nano coated wire on the outside of the plastic bag. We were using things like coat hangers to open up the bag so that we create we increased the surface area, and then. What I told them to do was follow the rules of alchemy and seed your uh, reactors. Don't just, you know, say, well, I don't see anything. Seed them with a little bit of gas water as to put them in the, the direction that you want them to go. If, plas if you can get what you want from plasma, then a drop of CO2 gas inside of there should start the, the process of, of creating it. I'm just looking at this yeah, purely yeah. from plasma. Just with an external wire around the plastic bag uh -huh. and the and the seed of the CO2 and salt water. No, yeah. no another metal. You don't use another metal. Just I'm another not, coated. Upper. We would like to move into where we are actually m manufacturing the gas without the metals coming in contact with the water, so we can increase the purity. All right. So what I'm looking at especially with CO2 gas reactors, because everybody keeps saying that, well, we can't get anything out of them when we put the, when we put the wires on the outside. And I'm saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. Take the plastic bag, the Ziploc bags that you, throw, that you throw things in the freezer with, okay? Take it and fill it up with the, with, some, with the salt solution that you would use for your reactors, okay? Then tape the wires on the outside of the bag and seed the water on the inside and seed it with what you want. I mean, if you're okay. creating the conditions, I have to, because I, this is something that uh, Kesh talked about, that there's been an anomaly. You, I've had people tell me that they're making GANs, and when they disassemble their GANs reactors, that there's still GANs being made. And in your experience, it work. Do you see the GANs uh, you know, increasing in quantity? I don't know. The, we started yesterday. Oh, yeah. But we started yesterday, what I wanted to do was I really wanted to get a very high level CO2. So since I got a, a group that's actually, uh, their house is on a highway, I was like, well, it's gotta be huge amounts of CO2 in the air where you're living. So I'm trying to take the armpits of what the, these societies have to offer us and start to convert them immediately. So if you live by a highway, then you, you basically have a CO2 Gantz factory right there. So why not figure but, out- But you can go. Go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, you keep your bag open, open to the air, right? Yep. Keep the bag open to the air with, uh, I use, we used coat hangers. Yeah. And we punctured two holes uh -huh. in the top of it so that we could hang it. You know how you have a railing on your house and it is, you know, there's like, it's like a picket fence, but it's made out of steel, you know, a railing. And right? you have those openings. Mm -hmm. Each one yeah. of those openings, we put a bag inside of it. Right, oh, and we left it open, and it's by the highway. So I'm thinking by seeding the, the reactor, right, putting the, the the coils on the outside of the plastic bag, which is a very thin layer, which means that uh, you're going to have an interaction. 
can I start to produce a very, very high uh, or pure CO2 that is of a, a different magnitude? And if we do that, can I do it with other things too? Like, do I need the copper to be on the outside, on the inside? Can I just put the copper on the outside and then seed it and start to get the CO, the CS3 or CO2? Can I do that? Okay, so let me go back um, to the experiments that were used for um, uh, creating food, uh, where um, I, I did an experiment where I took a uh, nano-coated cup, I put a um, cup of pla a plastic cup of water on top of the nano-coated cup, and I put a peach on top of it. And after uh, two days, I pulled the plastic cup with water out of the uh, nano-coated cup, and I drank the water, and the water had, oh, and I put a, a, a CO2, um, CO2 GANs next to it. The water had the taste of the peach, and in, in my mind, that water was GANs water. In other words, it had the, the GANs of that peach in the water. So when we're talking about the metals, it's one thing, but I think that some of the processes can be as simple as um, utilizing water as your tool to uh, bring about a GAN state of the water to do whatever you want. Now, when they did some of the healing things, they did the same thing where they did the uh, essence of oil uh, next to the, the, the nano-coated cup with uh, a CO, CO2 um, GANs next to it. So I think what you're gonna find is that uh, the whole concept of what is a GANs may be opened up uh, in, 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 uh, in, our, in, our, in our ability to work with some of this plasma fields. Okay, so let me throw this one out here to you then. Because this is an idea that I had, and um, we've been implementing it, but I think that there are still various uh, um, results, so I, I haven't really talked about it. And that is, we're looking at a condition, right? So let's let us look at a watermelon. A watermelon is ninety six percent water. Okay. Now the question is, if we want to create a gas, we have to have what they call a salt solution in the water, right? All right, so if we take a hypodermic needle and we push it inside of the uh, inside of the watermelon, okay, and then we put the nano coils on there, all right. Can we create a, what I call an eatable gans or consumable gans of a higher magnitude? Because they, you know, if if orange juice is a type of gans water, can we increase the gravitational and magnetic fields of the wa these gans waters so that they are not quite uh, an alloy where they're too high and we step them down enough for human consumption. And can um, then- Yeah, okay. I, think, I think what you wanna do is use, use water because water has unique properties and the water uh, can carry the GANs energy by itself and become consumable. Now, eventually this plasma generators that we have are, we're going to find that by placing the watermelon next to it um, and, and um, there's going there's more to it than just that but it, eventually when when he has another um, add-on feature if you will uh, we're going to be able to put a watermelon next to it and the whole village is going to be able to um, uh, consume watermelon without without having uh, drank anything or done anything. It's basically gonna be plasma energy that they're gonna be able to take as much as they want um, of whatever they want. Uh, but that's where this thing's really heading. Of course, beautiful thing. Cause I'm ready to get rid of my lungs and my digestive system. I damn sure am. I'll be the first <laughs> to tell you that. So yeah, I do believe that, yeah. But until then, what I'd like to do is I'd like to play with the I like to play with the the technology and let us see how 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 creative we can get with it. You know, like there are going to be stages before we get to complete plasma absorption. 
And I think that some of the different stages is where we can be create creative and be creators. You know, one of the things that, uh, that it talks about in the ancient teachings is a, the, a magi, or in my situation, uh, an, a Quetzalcoatl, which is a creator God. Uh, who, who brings civilizations, all right, and helps to teach people how to be teachers. Uh, you know, I, it, it defies my, the, the level of understanding where we have to pay for education because what if none of us can pay? Then who's going to take, how, how is the knowledge being passed on? It's completely inefficient and it can't work like that anymore. May I ask a, a question? Uh, hello. Go ahead. Yeah, Rick, uh, I, I want to ask uh, all you guys uh, if there is any consensus returning to the coils, if there is any consensus about uh, what's the better way to go with the, with the coding, the nano coding. Uh, do you think it's the best way to torch it on, or, or the, because I have 24 coils already done and I'm, I am, I <laughs> am, not sure because you know as as you already know it takes time effort and uh, i already did 12 of them because i saw this uh, pdf showing that they must be tied to each other so i rebuilt 12 of them uh, and uh, now in the process of nano coding i'm you know hesitating because i don't know what is the the best way to go that's why i'm asking if there any consensus of this What's better? I don't think Plasma. we know yet because um, we don't have the results in from all the experiments and the thousands of units that are out there. Um, if it works, then do you want something that's better, that works better? Is that what you're thinking? You're afraid to do it? No, in a certain what way? I'm trying, no, what I'm trying, because this is an experiment that, you know, if, if it can be done, in a couple of days, it's okay, you know, trial and error, do it again, and so back and forth. But it takes a month, you know, once you do the system and uh, you build the, create the guns, immerse the, those coats in guns, let it dry, blah, 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 and then start little by little, you know, loading them. It will take like three weeks to one month. So then after one month, you can have an idea of the efficiency of the system. And maybe 5% or 95%, who knows? That's why if we have any feedback at this point, we can save some time and then improve or go from there and try to, you know, get it better and better. But, you know, starting from something that uh, makes sense because there are so uh, different opinions. Right. And uh, for me, okay. what they posted in the PDF is... Uh, is well, you know, that's easy. That's easy. You just wait another month or two, and we'll find out what's going on. Exactly. Uh, I'll share. I'll yeah. share that. Uh, you know, I, I tried both processes: the uh, um, the torching of the of the coils and the nano coating, and, and I liked the quality uh, and the consistency of the uh, hot caustic method um, much better, and I felt more comfortable with the with the product versus the uh, um, the, the heating, the heating, um, I had a little bit of a problem with, you know, what was the exact right temperature and how do I get everything, you know, at that exact right temperature, because if you overheat them, it's a problem. Um, well, that's right. So there's a lot now, of techniques out there. I think the there. key is don't, you know, try, try to start with one. Don't try to start with six of them at a time where you're, you're probably going to end up with, you know, six mistakes versus yeah. Mistake. No, I, I, I'm doing one for, for my use, another for my neighbor. We are doing it together, so it's uh, that better. But, you know, uh, I, we were ready to start with, uh, with uh, the caustic process. Uh, when we saw this PDF showing the torching, we stopped saying, well, uh, maybe the, the group will know better. Or, but since there is no any, any uh, opinion that goes in some way or the other but i think that i, I agree with you john uh, i will go with the the caustic the, the original method sure go with whatever you feel comfortable with uh, you know renan happened to introduce the heat method and that's what they're doing in the philippines and apparently he has good results with that 
but that doesn't mean that uh, you're going to have good results with it or I will or whatever. It all depends on individual techniques and maybe the particular atmosphere in your particular area or something like that. There's so many variables that it's difficult to say. Different kinds of copper, different kinds of heating techniques. Uh, some say to use the uh, butane or propane and others say just to use uh, electric heat because you shouldn't be introducing other particles into it and so on and so Correct. forth. So there's different concepts. Electric heat, in, you said? Yeah, like yeah. you can use an electric burner or um, you know, oven type because of uh, I was, thing. I was thinking use, uh, you know, a current. What if they well, that's, heat, that's heat another it. way to do it. You could actually put a current through the wire, heat it up enough to um, turn it um, almost red hot, and then, uh, well, in fact, you could keep a current way, in. Since you can control the current, you can control the temperature. That's why I that's like right. that, but I was in doubt. Though. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I, I love that yeah. idea. Yeah, and it, it may be that when we run these units, that f when they're initially run in for the first couple of weeks, that might be part of the process is that gradual heating and the heating keeps the nano coating process going and uh, makes it all sort of um, more solidified into the environment. So it's uh, interacting with the environment more and so on. Yeah, if you put it in a, in a cold caustic, making the, the cold caustic solution, and then put it the coil with uh, an electrode on the ends and uh, regulating the current and watching the, with a, a measurement of the temperature, uh, you will reach like three, 400 degrees. It will make a lot of bubble, but it won't get red and it will start interacting with that environment. And uh, then it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a matter of uh, time and watching till it gets dark or, or, or black. And, and that's it. It's a matter of trying. I, I don't know. One thing you're going to have to really watch out for uh, if you're using current to heat your wire, the, uh, the, the purity of the material, the density of the material, right. which is going to be all over the place within the wire, and uh, uh, its actual physical dimensions all have to be absolutely perfect or you will never get it the same temperature all through the wire. Um, do you want to stop the uh, screen share so we can put in the different screen share? I think we're done the yeah. porcelain part here. Do, do you want me, you guys wanted me to finish this. The only other thing that I wanted to add about the cold porcelain was that I was looking at this for the, uh, for the, um, what do they call them? Capacitors. I was looking, because if you need an inert, uh, something that's inert that will not uh, catch uh, fire, then I'm thinking that I can actually uh, uh, make tubing that I can use for my uh, my uh, capacitors using this cold porcelain method here. And and if so I wrap the wires around the uh, cold porcelain uh, before it dries, I can basically set in grooves so I don't have to worry about the nanowires ever escaping off of the capacitors. Yeah, because porcelain is normally porcelain is normally a very good uh, insulator. So I'm not sure how that's going to work with the capacitors. But maybe if you put something special in it to make it so it's more plasmatic or something, it may possibly work. Yes. Why don't you try it and see if it'll work? That's what we're doing. <clears throat> right. That's on. what we're doing. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can you guys can take the screen off if you want. Uh, well, there... you got to stop it, bud. Okay. How do I? All right. I'll stop it. Stop screen share. Okay. I stopped but, uh, it. Okay. Good. All right. And okay. Let me see what they have. So I thought we could put coils up. Oh, we talked about coils here. So we oh, see nice. what do we have. <clears throat> Those are Ubix uh, coils. He's got some other ones here. Rick, can you hear me? This is Robert. Yes, hi, Robert. Hi, guys. Uh, I had this idea for a while now. I don't know how practical it would be to for nano coating. I was thinking if you put a your copper coils or wires in a caustic bath and put it in a microwave and heat the water 
uh, with the microwave and the metal uh, being in a microwave would uh, would heat up also, but I, you know, I don't know what kind of an effect you would get. Sounds like you're gonna short out your microwave. Uh, well, it'd be a fun video for someone to do, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, not not Any only volunteers? that. Uh, if you want, if you want to see what basically what's going to happen to the wire structure, the actual molecular structure of your wire, <laughs> take an old CD that you don't want anymore and put it in your microwave. Um, what it, what's going to happen is it'll crack up into quarter wavelength little squares. Like they won't be a perfect squares, but it'll look like a like a checkerboard after it's done. And uh, uh, so you're going to wind up with an incredibly hot spot every quarter wavelength of the 2.4 gigahertz that the microwave runs on throughout your wire. It's it it um it might work. Uh, from what I understand, the RF theory and how metals react in high uh, high frequency radio waves, it's just going to cause problems. Yeah, the only problem. Hello, it's Shandor here. The only problem is all the safety instructions for the home use microwave ovens says don't put any metal into them. Well, uh, I, I did some research on that. Uh, apparently, if you have metal uh, utensils, let's say spoons and forks, uh, the spoons will not arc. You can, you can leave a spoon in your microwave and nothing will happen. But if it's a fork with sharp ends and corners, uh, that's where it's going to arc. So I'm thinking if the coil is in the water, it's in a liquid submerged, uh, the liquid will sort of distribute the heat. And I don't know what kind of an effect you would get, but you know, I've never gotten to trying it. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. It's something if, I'd consider if, it as well. If you try that, it takes some distance from the microwave just in case. Yeah, it's a very dangerous proposition to be having cost, hot caustic inside a microwave where it could explode and uh, then you would have hot caustic all over everything, uh, essentially. Yeah, and like, it's like very, Jamie, very, 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 very serious situation. <laughs> even this... Remember that caustic can blind you. Yes, well, you one, drop is en one drop is enough to blind you in your eye. Take care with caustic because if you have a caustic spill, you don't wipe it, it dries. Later, you touch it with your fingers and you will find very serious burns. Yeah, you can get into the nerves of your fingers and whatnot too. There was a guy that I studied. Um, <clears throat> I th I'm pretty sure that his uh, videos are on YouTube. And he was actually taking glass and he was creating gold and platinum out of it. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but you can probably uh, just go on to YouTube and you can find it. And he was using microwaves. Yeah, uh, he, he was using crucibles inside of the microwaves in order to do it. So, uh, you know, maybe his methodology, maybe something that you can incorporate into what you're talking about. You can take a look at his videos there on YouTube. I think all you have to uh, do is something like uh, uh, gold from glass or something like that. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of um, YouTube videos uh, with microwaves, and some of them are useful in a sense. And there's actually science experiments that are going on with just ordinary household type microwaves. There's one that creates an actual plasma um, using a microwave that exists for about a third of a second or so as a plasma ball in your room. And there's another one where you can create a plasma inside a microwave by just simply putting a grape in there and microwaving a grape. grape. Yeah, yeah. It turns I into saw that a, one. It turns into a plasma, but that's like a you know sort of a high temperature type plasma, not the kind of plasma that we're necessarily interested in. Maybe you could put a microwave in the middle of your coils and actually uh, receive some of the plasma energy from a from a grape that was turning into plasma, perhaps. I'm not sure about that, but uh, definitely there's uh, room for experimentation there for people that want to try that sort of thing. But I would not advise, a, I cannot advise a microwave and hot caustic. That doesn't sound like a good combination. Uh, 
Same as boiling hot caustic is a bit tricky too. But <clears throat> people do it and get away with it. Uh, the 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 HH, HHO guys, they have something. Uh, I, I couldn't remember exactly what it was, but they were tampering with that also. Uh, that the entire genre of HHO, Browns Gas, these guys, they were they were doing something uh, with the microwaves also. I'm not really sure what. So I I'd, I'd go, I'd definitely go over those uh, HHO guys also because they got some good stuff in those uh, in those videos. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Pia. I saw you had your hand up there. Go ahead. Yeah, and I'm just want to add, uh, like to hear if somebody of you had the experience with the stove. Um, for example, if you make the coating in the stove, uh, can you eat? Can you make food afterwards in the stove? stove? You mean like um, in an oven, for example? Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, oven, exactly. Yeah, the oven isn't uh, hot enough to create the nano coating, as far as I know. But the stovetop uh, burner would, like on a um, on a coil on an oven, or not an oven, sorry, on the stovetop that you would cook with your with your pots pans, <clears throat> um, that can get hot enough to, for example, heat up pennies or a coil of copper and that sort of thing. Um, I I I don't think it would be a problem at all to have a bit of uh, nano black nano copper fall down into your into your coil of your stove or something it's it's not a, a big deal it's not something that you would want to you know eat a spoonful of or something like that no <clears throat> but um, yeah. the nano coating the nano coating is not uh, uh, super toxic as far as the black uh, copper oxide. You just have to be careful with it, and not get it, you know, all all over yourself. It's in, in nanoparticles are, they can be uh, um, dangerous in certain ways in certain configurations, and that's the thing. You don't really know what's what shape nanoparticles you've got until you have them analyzed, and not too many of us, if any, have analyzed the surface to actually see what we have in terms of nanoparticles and and whether they're uh, of a shape that might be more dangerous than other shapes and that sort of thing but I, essentially it's not that big of a problem um, it might be more of a, an issue if you had uh, GANS co covered coils that you were baking in your oven or something for some reason yeah, yeah I, was working, I was working with a fellow who's uh, doing an experiment with a kiln um, and we were working at temperatures that he should work with. And what we came up with was somewhere around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, your oven is only going to get a little bit above 500 degrees. Yeah, I was going to so, say uh, four or 500 degrees uh, centigrade would be one of the sweet zones for uh, copper, for example. And most ovens yeah, only go up to about Just 300. below where it turns red, which should be yeah. about 1,100 degrees. So we thought mm -hmm. somewhere around nine 900 to 1,000 would be about right. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I can forget everything about my electric oven. Oh yeah, yeah pretty, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you'd have to use a, you could preheat it if you wanted to in the oven, and then use a torch, and it would go much faster and easier that way. Is you you could have it on a uh, um, Pyrex or preferably a ceramic tile kind of. Uh, situation and it could be in your oven preheating and then you just use the torch and it wouldn't take as much energy from the torch to give it a a good coating plus you'd have the inner coil heated up nicely that way too so there might be a use for it that way but generally or it's also an oven can be used to dry the coils um once they're covered with gans that was mentioned uh, yesterday as well yeah, if you're going to dry in your oven, uh, keep your temperatures below 200 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius. Ooh. That makes sense. Yeah. And and generally, it wouldn't be a problem. That's not like the GANS is going to evaporate and get all over your stove or something. It's, uh, it's more sticks to the coils. But 
depending on what your GANS water was, you know, generally is mostly water, so it'll just evaporate. It shouldn't be a big issue unless you have all kinds of weirdness in there. Somebody's talked about uh, about <laughs> um, um, mercury GANS in the plasma group today, and they were going to make mercury GANS, but that's pretty much highly it's frowned upon fun. because... Uh, Mercury itself is dangerous enough, and any of the ganses from mercury would probably be a hundred times more so. So, and then if you put that in the oven, well, good luck. <laughs> you better evacuate the neighborhood in that case. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what would happen, but um, it doesn't seem advisable to use toxic stuff in your oven in any case. No. Unless you have a kiln, the kiln would be a better situation. So. Yeah, but also like fire maybe would be the most easy. Instead fire well, seems the, to be the, the most easy with the and CH3, quick. Uh, the CH3 GANs, that might be rather volatile because there's so much hydrogen in it. But um, the other two, the, the carbon dioxide and the copper oxide, no, they're pretty much inert. Mm. Yeah, but I won't like to make it be big cake after this, you know, if I had to do this in my, my stove. Gee, this cake tastes funny. <laughs> yeah. Gans cake. Yeah. 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 But uh, on, on, I've done a little bit of fire coating. I've done some uh, um, cold caustic, hot caustic. I much prefer the hot caustic method. I get so much better results with that. It's always consistent. It's always the same. Uh, as long as you say follow the same procedure, you know it's going to work. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm just going to go that route. And I used to work for a place in Richmond down by the airport. And we had a, a hot tank about the size of two, two buses long that we used to soak everything in. And so doing a, a massive industrial hot caustic method is not really a big deal. It's, we've already got the equipment to do it. Yes, but true. with these coils, uh, John, with these coils, these coils are already really heavy. Uh, so I think that uh, I was thinking that if I decide to go with the caustic, it should be a lot of it. I mean, not caustic, but the, the, a lot of gallons of water. And so when you immerse the coils, uh, it won't alter the temperature. Otherwise, it will pull it. Uh, a lot because these are, are heavy yeah you could you could preheat the coils um, I was thinking about that myself because uh, even with the, the the one reactor that I'm making it's way too much material for the little containers that I have and I'm thinking uh, you know like a 10 gallon or a 15 gallon canning pot on my barbecue to boil the water so I can boil 15 gallons at a time uh, it, it, when you're deal, yeah. dealing with this much mass, this much matter, yeah, it's you got to think on a large scale. And to preheat them, to get them up to, you know, 100, 150 degrees in an oven or something beforehand, um, yeah, I, I can't see how that would hurt it. It would probably work better. Yeah, but the problem with, is that you need to preheat it and get everything done, ready, and immediately throw them on the, the chicken wire and you know, start the process because otherwise it makes no sense because since this metal is so conductive, it will cool down immediately. Oh, it's not so much, not so more complicated than a three course meal. Uh, just, just a matter of timing and planning out your steps first. Yeah. I have a question yeah. about plasma coating. And plasma. The, the question that I have about plasma coating is, it, is it the same characteristics as caustic? Because if it's not, then we can actually just plasma coat the, the, the copper wire before we even form it. How, I, would how think do you that, do I would think coating with plasma, you would have a, a more, um, what's the word, not coherent. Um, uh, I can't even think of the word. Are you talking GANs or plasma? Um, he, he's I'm talking, talking about using the plasma to coat with. Right. What, 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 what's the source of plasma? What, yeah, what plasma, what plasma are you okay. specifying? Let us, let us go through the four stages of nano coating, which you have nano coating with caustic and electricity, nano coating with just caustic, 
nano coating with fire, and then nano coating with plasma. Now, what I'm asking is because the now, you won't be able to nano coat with plasma until you have a plasma reactor. Correct. What, what, I'm, what I'm asking is about is about mass production. Okay. If does the uh, does the the nano coating that we do with plasma does it have the same characteristics of the other three? Can we actually nano coat the wires before we even form them? Like, has anyone seen the what the nano coating looks like when you do it with a pure plasma device? Like if you had a magrive unit and you were uh, and you nano coated with that, is it flexible then to where we can actually form it before we even uh, uh, we can actually nano coat spools, huge amounts of spools uh, uh, with uh, the plasma so that basically all we have to do is form the coils and it's done. The nature of the nano coating, if you were to take a nano coated wire and bend it into a circle, uh, whatever is on the outside of that circle is going to get ripped apart. There's, there's no way around it. Uh, now this is on an atomic scale. So it's going to disrupt that, that atomic, um, structure the the i don't know if it's a crystalline structure that it's created on that i think it's probably pretty close to a crystalline structure on the outside which is does not going to be know? a flexible structure. What say they, that again does anyone know what the structure is uh if it's pure if it's nano coated purely in plasma nobody knows what the structure is to begin with it's all conjecture and what where what we understand is that it's pulling the atoms off the surface, not enough to release them into into the environment, but just enough so that they they increase the space between them, which reduces the, the field strength between them and allows the plasma to flow through. So when yeah. you when when you manipulate that wire, you're actually going to alter that structure somewhat that does. And I don't see it doesn't matter whether it's plasma coated or, or heat coated you're going to manipulate that structure when you move that wire. Okay. Yeah. Now when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with caustic, we're dealing with actual real matter. Now, if we're dealing with plasma coating, nano coating, wouldn't the plasma, because you're using that same plasma anyway, wouldn't it actually uh, nano coat all of those gaps? What Afterwards? gaps? What gaps? I mean, they would do this, it would so. do the same thing. It would do the same thing with a caustic coating. Um, the, 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 the issue that we're, we're having is, especially with what Moran was teaching, um, people want instant results. They want to make it, they want to cook it, they want to put it together and they want to see something happen. They don't want to wait two weeks for it to fix itself so that things can happen. So that's why he's saying, don't, you know, try not to mess with the wire because you'll damage the coating. And it, and it doesn't stop the thing from working. It just delays it from operating at efficiency. Yeah, that, that, but that was my, my, my uh, point that I was, I was looking at was um, if, if we're going to be using the same exact kind of plasma, because a pure plasma system can nano coat wires. So if we have those wires nano coated, even if the surface areas have gaps in them, because we're using the same kind of plasma, would it not be nano coated over and eventually and create a uniform surface or a uniform fields sure yeah. it just might take a few months so you would have to have months to make each coil instead of minutes well remember what he said about turning on and off a light switch every time we turn on and off a light switch we go back and, and kind of start over again of uh, going from the matter state to the plasma state so if you had a nick on your wires or a gap uh it will re -nano code itself when you plug it back in correct Right, but it just might take time to do that, like nano coating yeah. the wires in your house or whatever. The same as a, as a example, look at the uh, connections on a, most car batteries. You'll see some corrosion forming on one terminal, and if that's allowed to continue, it'll start growing and growing, and eventually it gets right into the copper cable, and it'll start running all the way up the cable and deteriorating it until it falls apart and uh, that's a different kind of copper oxide and it's a different kind of coating process that leads to deterioration and that's not the kind we're interested in but it's, it just shows how it grows. It grows from its uh, seed you might say and because of the fields around it it just continues to spread. 
as a, a nano coating. Some cases quite vivid, which can be a fuzzy blue um, coating on on the uh, electrodes of uh, of a battery, for example. But one one of the interesting questions will become is when we plasma coat our wires, will we need to have the GANs to put on them after that, in that they already have these they're already carrying these plasma fields. Or what if we turned it in our favor and we nano coated the wires before we formed the, the uh, coils and then use the GANs to filling those gaps where we're actually inserting uh, GANs uh, in deeper crevices or embedding it into the uh, coil. And then well, it just gets into the, it gets into the yeah. problem. Are you saying you, you would already bend the coil and have it already formed before you do that? Or I think you... that... It, I'm saying that I, I would nano coat it when it's on a spool and then I would make the coils. Yeah, well, that doesn't work so good because nano coatings don't like to be bent and handled and uh, and so on. They tend to flake off and otherwise uh, not be consistent. Is that the same characteristics that it would have if you did it with plasma also? I would think so, yes. Um, you got to remember the nano coating itself is the wire for the plasma. The wire, once it's coated, is just structure. It, it does nothing. Just holds the coating up. That's all. The coating is the wire for the plasma. So it needs to be as coherent as possible with as little occlusions in it. Otherwise, you're just going to obstruct that plasma flow. And it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, it's like water flowing through a creek where the banks have fallen down. It's going to back up and get lots of pressure there, and it will eventually blow all that through and 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 run through. But it again, like we're saying, it's going to take time. So you want as clean and smooth and free of flowing uh, uh, conduit for the plasma as you can get. Okay. Well, then, how about if we started to maybe think about eliminating the copper or eliminate that's, eliminate that's, that that came up in the last workshop mr cash has talked about that for about eight years yeah, now. that's coming up where we make we make the the system we nano code it and when we apply a process which removes 99.9 percent .9 of the copper out of it you wind up with just this cylinder of nano so then right. i would like to throw out i would like to throw out uh, an idea and i hope that it adds to the knowledge i was thinking about this uh, about a month ago and we were we were really going in on this and what i what the, the idea that I came up with was using the 3D printers, all right, to produce a, um, a mold for being able to just pour the copper. And the mold, the, it, it should already have the coils in, in consensual order, already hooked up, everything already done, yeah? And we pour the mold in there, and the mold can be paper thin, nano-coated, and then we have nanotubing which is what Kesh said is the, is the most powerful, correct? Well, as a mold maker, I can see where you're going with this, but I'll tell you that would be incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> well, you know, I tried the, I tried the nanotubing. Uh -huh. and, uh, I don't believe that uh, you get the creation of plasma fields with the tubing as well as you get with the coiling. And if you notice, all of his uh, his activities has been towards this concept of the coiling, and you see it on a lot of the um, other things. It's all about the coils. Right. We can actually pour the coils. We can pour the coils in a mold, and with uh, the 3D printers, we can get a lot of detail, especially with some of the really really expensive ones. All right. So in a CNC machine. Is also something that uh, 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 that we could probably think about um, because I just believe that if what we're looking at is one kilo of 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 uh, copper just so we can access the surface area of it, uh, yeah, like let us figure out how we get the rest of that copper out of it. Well, uh, uh, with the three layers of the coils, the outer the outer spring, the inner spring, and the single wire going around the inside. There is simply no way to do that in a mold. Okay, um, it's not, that's not possible. You can do each piece separately and put it together later, but Correct. you can't do one single thing in a mold. It, it's not 
It's not possible. Simple, simple as that. So uh, the the efficiency that you're looking for by doing it in an, in a, a molding system uh, just kind of evaporates because it's so fast to turn coils. If, can, can I paint a little picture for you, Khalil? Where we're going with with this, in my mind, is that these plasma generators, or not generators, but plasma um, power centers are going to be creators of plasma fields for us. And with these plasma fields, um, so a lot of the people are going to become plasma manipulators or plasma users. And when you get to become a plasma user, you'll find out that you have the ability to create anything you want. So yeah, you'll, the first the unit way. that we're making, we're now walking into this brand new territory where everybody can become equal. Um, and as we have, you know, our first units, you know, remember he's talking about the spaceship. Now we don't need a single bolt or single screw. Um, we're having a little bit difficult time using just our mind right now, but the, these plasma generators are going to help us um, see uh, exactly what it is that we could do that we thought we couldn't do. Yeah, for example, one thing that came up, one thing that came up in discussion, for example, uh, he mentioned that you you take your reactor, you condition it, it's running really good. You walk up to it, you put your left hand on the reactor, and you throw out in a in a pulse the thought of apple, and an apple appears in your right hand. Um, this is where we're going with this, and eventually we're not going to need the machine. This is the well, tool to teach us what plasma is and how we are already plasma. Well, um, the teachings that that are in several of the Aboriginal teachings in America, uh, they talk about this very extensively. So um, we're well aware of all of this, being able to be creators. God creates with plasma. So since God is within us, then we are gods. And that's what we teach, uh, to be creator gods, to go out and to create. So yeah, I understand all of that. But right now, <laughs> The only thing that I'm throwing out is ideas. I think that the best part of creating is to throw out as many, none of, not, not very many of our ideas are gonna make it past, you know, a few feet, but the processes of, of throwing them out there will create something better. So I, I, I understand exactly where we're going with this. Uh, there are some people that I believe were in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was the Essenians. Uh, one of the things that they taught was to uh, envision roses in your mind and then try and smell the rose, which is a very low level of what, what, what you're talking about right now, which is creating the things in your mind. So uh, create, being a creator God is, the, uh, is where we're going with this. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty aware of that. Yep, and uh, uh, I've mentioned a couple of people now on Skype groups and, and in a private chats you know, they're looking at, well, how can I make this more? How can I make this efficient? I want to make this as big as possible. And I'm like, well, why? You're going to have unlimited energy in a very simple, non-restrictive, ridiculously easy to make device. Why would you even think of 10% of efficiency increase? What's the point? Um, unlimited is unlimited. I mean, how, how can you have infinity plus one? It doesn't work. It's either infinite or it's not. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at that nanotubing because I think that once we have it, we'll be able to decrease the amount of uh, copper that we need and, or, or pre probably be able to uh, decrease even the configuration of the coils where they can be much more uh, open because they're completely uh, nanotubing. So there's a lot of different geometrical shapes that we can choose when we're going into uh, just making it completely a, a tubing. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to use this, the fields, and it'll make it a lot easier to create. I think that Kesh is just showing us how to concentrate our own plasmas. I really the, the, the next know. generation reactors. Uh, he's already released it. Um, that they're going to be about the size of a pancake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One Which thing is, we'll run into is wire. yeah, we don't want to use a smaller cross section of wire, uh, like in microtubing. 
would sound good in terms of it could be nano coded inside and out. You'd think that'd be the best, but it may be that this particular device has to be able to transfer a certain amount of what's called amperage um, to yeah, this to run device, it. Yes, definitely. So because this it, is, this is, if we this were to have the same range. same diameter wire, but it was hollow, it may not work for this example. It may work better plasmatically, but it may not work to on the matter level to be part mm -hmm. of the initiation of this particular device. Mm -hmm. But that, but the, the 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 size of the of the copper supposedly it won't matter because we are talking here about the plasma circuit. Let's right. Say. The transfer is well, the plasma. So. That depends. Are we or are we not? That that depends. Is is the actual. Uh, um, is there an actual flow of electrons through this system? And if there is, then they need the room to be able to flow, unless they are flowing in a superconducting and you know type manner, in which case that's a different situation. But if your well, device if was, was superconducting and then suddenly part of your nano coating broke down and then it became conducting, then you want to have the I, I uh, matter Rick, level that, wires or yeah, think yeah. something's going to go up and smoke you you're right but uh, i think that the size of the copper uh matters uh after the connection to the system with the size of the copper uh because all the system does is transfer energy from the plasma into the lower level of magraph to the matter level let's say and when it, when it exits it exits you know through a cable and the, the size of that cable matters not the size of the system, may maybe I'm not sure, but that that's what I'm reasoning. Well, yeah, we, we have to, it, there's not going to be heat. Okay, we have to think about also the principles here, yeah. And the principles here is that we we want to move into completely plasmatic energy systems. All right, so the electron will be eliminated at, at some point completely. So what I'm thinking about is more from a conditioning point of view versus a uh, uh, um, uh, continuing to think in the lines of how can I manipulate the electrons. So that's why I'm saying that the tubing will will decrease the amount that we'll need because we we will have conditioned our systems so that we can receive plasma in much well, in higher, higher volumes. Makes sense. In a superconductive uh, nano state, you won't have to worry about the the volume of material, uh, even the nano materials, because even at uh, uh, say 500 atoms diameter piece of nanomaterial is going to be able to transmit an infinite amount of plasma energy. It's a superconductor. There's no there's no resistance. All it is is a pathway that the plasma likes to flow through. And exactly. Exactly. size. Once we get into the plasma, the size doesn't matter. Yeah, the size is. I'm I'm thinking the about the conditioning to accept it. You see, fellas. That's all I'm talking about. You know, you got a lot of people that are looking at this and the only thing that they're looking like looking for is exactly what Kesh said is electrons. They want a few electrons. You know, the, I, I think that the funny thing about this is, is that he, he clearly told a lot of people that, you know, you can create flight very easily once you have a stacker or, or, or this uh, kind of uh, uh, apparatus. But as well, we can create medical devices and we can feed ourselves. And still people are only thinking about how many electrons can I get out of it? Yes. So, you know. But, but remember, man, that we are still interfacing with the old system. That's why we need to do that. And that's right. what I'm talking and, about. And also, also remember that it's part of our job to educate people, to let them know that these systems are more than just the electron level stuff and it's more than yeah. just your percent off your hydro it's bill that you're getting technology yeah yeah i'm it's telling everybody i talk to about this the, the the electrical output is a possible byproduct not right good, thank good, you good way to put it good <laughs> way you. to put exactly, it exactly exactly it's not thank it's you. not just what like, the prime just, thing is just like having matter like once we once we have the conversion device where we have the the our, our maggrav reactor and we set this conversion device beside it and we push a button and get a glass of water that again that's a byproduct of the plasma it's not the output yeah. of the device 
we right. can create light energy whatever yeah mm-hmm. right right okay. and and i think that uh it was dr walter russell that really opened my eyes to this when uh he said that light doesn't travel it only reflects and uh it took me a while to understand that until um until I did my studies into uh, what Kesh was talking about with the interaction from the magnetic gravitational field of the center of the planet it, in combination with the sun is what creates the friction that causes the light that you see. Yeah, it's the, it's the interface with the, it's the friction, the leftovers of the interaction of those yeah. fields. Yes, yes. So it all made sense to me then. It was all plasma and it's just about directing it and slowing it down to what you want it to be. Yeah, so we have a superconducting ultimate plasma unit sitting on our table that produces all the plasma we could possibly want. <laughs> Let's go from there. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about whether this thing is 90% efficient or 98% efficient. I don't right. care. I could care less if it's 10% efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I've got so much to work with now. I'm already past that. I'm, I'm okay. This thing works. I know it works. I'm going to have this kind of energy. What can I do with the energy? That's where I'm going with this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started to uh, just try and uh, create in my mind as much as I can. So that's why in my groups, I, listen, I don't think that it, you guys, we're not going to really have any fun until we really got a lot of people creating these things and we're enjoying what we're doing. I, I, I continue to tell people all the time, the best part of life is fun. fun. Well, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to when I hand one of these devices to the Quechuan people down in Peru, because they are intensely spiritual people. And um, when the shaman sees me walking in with this thing, what he's going to see is this big bright light. He's not even going to see me. He's just going to see the plasma and he's going to go, wow, what can I do with that? And they're going to do amazing things down there. I, I, I was in Machu Picchu and uh, yeah, I, I'm very, very familiar with the, uh, with the cultures down there. And I, I'll tell you something, they are, they are not only, well, I, I will be happy when everyone has everything that they need. I will be happy for that. Well, you'll, you'll like this. Um, when we sent our envoy to talk to the Quechuan people down there, the chief of chiefs, uh, the first thing he said was, we've been waiting for you. Where have you been? So they know we're bringing this stuff and they are tickled pink. And that goes for the aboriginals, I think, all around the world now. Um, um, thank you. There are a couple of groups that have been in contact with the Kesh Foundation. The, well, I think it's called the Five Nations in... Uh, in uh, New York, and uh, also the Mohawks in uh, in uh, Ontario and Canada, and a couple of other groups are also um, interested. So I think that actually this type of technology, this plasma technology, and hopefully through the Keshe Foundation, is actually going to unite these uh, native tribes together because it is the common denominator that is the same for all of us everywhere you know plasma is plasma is plasma and it is the future and it is the future for the um, natives and aboriginals in in all the country i mean look at canada where i live where i come from and we have um i was just on the news today we're number seven in the world in uh, in uh, average income and we used to be number three a couple of years ago so they're all complaining oh, now we're number seven and we have to get better and all this kind of thing and yet we have this 20 uh, percent rate of uh, of um, uh, poverty among children in this country and a, a big high percent of that is in the aboriginal tribes and so on and you know the situation up north where you go up and you got these diesel generators that are generating the power for a town just polluting everything and and uh, or individual generators for homes that are polluting and it's just not you know not good using heavy fuels and if they can all have personal power supplies or personal uh, not just power supplies but life enabling units basically then it just uh, it just 
<laughs> it just changes the whole picture. And all of a sudden, uh, most of the con conflicts of the world are going to look pretty foolish. Um, because we don't have to have uh, some tribe in South America against uh, this major oil uh, producing, um, you know, rig that's destroyed their land and so on and conflicts there and conflicts in the Middle East over oil and all this kind of stuff. It'll take the, we, are, we are getting ready to the, you know, universal meeting, let's say. That's the, that's yeah. the first step is to be in peace with our, ourselves and then we can, we have a lot of things coming, you know, it's amazing to, to mm -hmm. live like you said, Rick, once uh, to live at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Shandor has his hand up and has probably patiently been waiting there. Um, <laughs> maybe you should hear from him. Shandor, you got something you'd like to add probably 10 minutes ago? Yes, yes. It's a subject which was discussed about 10 minutes ago. So, Kellel uh, suggested about uh, how about to save copper by uh, having less copper and more nano coating. Uh, of course, to have a nano coating which works, you need some copper uh, below. <coughs> and the question is how you make a tube from a wire. Because you can uh, burn it out, uh, you can remove later the copper, uh, which is a quite a difficult process, it's not so easy. But uh, this remembered me to the story which Mr. Cash told once about uh, uh, the architects uh, had the, the imagination to build a huge dome. And they didn't know how to do, what uh, shall hold uh, the bricks until they make the dome. Uh, once it's made, they will hold themselves. And uh, they announced uh, this request, anybody has an idea to come up with it. And finally, it was a child who came up with the idea. So uh, how, how about to make a big haystack and to build a dome ab above the haystack and later you remove the hay and you have the dome. And that's how they made the first dome. So similarly here, to make a mold, it's very difficult if you work in molding. Uh, furthermore, in casting, you need uh, certain uh, sections uh, to let the uh, molten metal to flow. You have uh, places to release the gas and so on. It's very complicated. It's not feasible. But one of the ways would be to create a support and uh, to build uh, copper over that support and to build uh, over that uh, the uh, nano layers. Which is what I was, well, this is what I was talking about, okay? Yeah, now, if, for the support, for the support, for instance, you could, you could use uh, some uh, kind of uh, thread or, or uh, not a metal wire, but uh, something which can be molten, like a plastic uh, string or something like that. Beeswax. Oh, wax. Yes. Um, wax will not be good for strings because it's uh, mechanically not enough stable. But if you think of industrial product, which involves a high investment, so expensive machines, it's not cheap to make it. It may be possible just to save copper if the copper will become a problem uh, for sourcing, uh, to uh, metallize with copper some uh, uh, plastic wires and uh, to make uh, the uh, coating on the top of them. That would be one of the ways. But still have to consider that uh, uh, what does it cost more if it, in terms of cost uh, uh, to this, what's more uh, efficient uh, economically to save some copper or uh, versus to invest in a, a very expensive uh, technology you came up with a good idea there what about plastic wires nano coated plastic wires <laughs> maybe that yeah, would actually not, work no, not, not. So you, we you, haven't you tried know, that there are metals to metallize there are metals to metallize in vacuum with uh, sputtering or uh, physical vapor deposition or magnetron sputtering mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some uh, uh, plastic pieces these are used daily in the industry you just see this uh, um, christmas uh, tree balls uh, they are all metallized to be shiny and beautiful and this is the way how they make mirrors just they have a plastic support not always glass and they metallize them so they are metals for them so you can discuss if you have engineers uh, who are working in such technologies to come up with ideas Meanwhile, recently I just uh, found on uh, Facebook uh, uh, somebody uh, had the idea, a genial idea about how to make even spacing between uh, the threads of the coil. Just a second, let me find that uh, 
window. I have 100 windows open, so it's not uh, uh, so fast. Just let me see where is that. Uh, I will find I will find it later. So one of the knowledge seekers. Uh, I just wish to, to give credits to his name. Sorry for I was not able to find it so quickly. Yes, I found it. Pedro Neves. I will try to to share uh, this uh, screen. So he published it and he shares it. It's no copyright problem, I think. Um, just let me share, share the screen. Where is that window? Okay. So it's in golden age of gans. Okay. Hi guys, I think I found a way to space evenly all the the coil. Yeah, I already. Yeah. And that's the trick. You have to place it. Some of you are a wire have... in between. In between two turns. Oh, hope you can see well there. You hold it with a plier and hold it tight and just turn till the end. And you that's know, that's it. interesting, but uh, I don't think you want to be doing okay. that. Um, I don't think you want to have that pull, want to pull apart. All the ones, all the pictures we've seen, they were all tight together. I tried initially pulling mine apart and I didn't like the concept of, you know, pulling them apart. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. what if we do I smaller, it what, what if we do a small, a very small diameter as far as the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the lead, okay? So the pipe that you had earlier, Sandra, what if we did a very small wire, small diameter wire as, as kind of like a lead? That, that would create a spacing itself that you could, you could, you could actually glue that uh, coil onto your um, bar so that when you started coiling, they, it would just fall into the grooves. And then yeah, you wouldn't have to do anything but just take it off. Yeah, Certainly, the there are different ways how to do it. Uh, my earlier idea, I didn't do it. Uh, uh, it's not so easy with two hands only. The earlier idea was uh, to coil together a wire and uh, a plastic string, which uh, would leave the spacing and a plastic yep. string being uh, like a fishing string. That's exactly the fishing string. That's exactly what I was thinking. Well, that, that you cut it later and you just uh, take it uh, apart and you throw it away and you, you use up uh, something else. That would be one of the ways. So now the question that Job Liven told about, he doesn't like the spacing. Yes, there are different uh, approaches as we told in yesterday's uh, uh, public workshop. Uh, there are some reasons uh, for making spacing and uh, sometimes it's uh, good, sometimes it's not necessary. Uh, if you uh, do the uh, all the coating process by the fire method, uh, in that case, uh, supposedly uh, that uh, temperature, high temperature creates uh, very well the coating uh, within uh, the uh, place where two uh, adjacent uh, uh, turns uh, are touching each other. But when you use liquids uh, like caustic, in that case, uh, it will not penetrate properly. And also when you do the drying process, in that case, uh, uh, that uh, touching parts will keep moist and it will not dry uniformly. So to make a uniform nano coating by the caustic process, I consider it's good to have some spacing in between. Otherwise uh, the coating may fail. So like, for example, on Richards, uh, I don't believe that he pulled his apart. And then no, like, he did not. Looked like his uh, coating to my coating looked like it, uh, it got in between all the gaps. He did, he did. Something I'd like to bring up about that, uh, that spacing idea that with the, you wrap the loop around and run it down the drill again. Um, if you're gonna do this, make sure you use dissimilar materials. If you use a piece of copper wire to do that with, you're gonna make a horrendous mess of your copper because it'll pick up and basically friction weld itself together. Um, you need something either significantly harder or significant, significantly softer than the copper, and then it won't damage the uh, the coil itself. 
Well, I'm, I'm from Boston, fellas. And the thing that I was thinking about was the fishing wire, using a high test line fishing wire and running it in, in series with the copper wire so that the, the spacing is there when I, as I coil it. The, the, the fishing wire will pop right off and the spacing will already be there. Yeah, you can try it. Um, you're going to have a hell of a time keeping it all nice and neat and even. Um, it's, yeah. it, having having one piece to control is one thing. Having two pieces to control and they have to be exactly the same, whole different animal. Well, Sandra has a lead that he has coming out of the draw. So, you know, I, I looked at that thing and I thought to myself, it, it, it's really set up like a sewing machine, kind of. And what I was thinking was that if 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 I were able to take maybe like an industrial stapler, stapler, and I was able to run it through both of those, yeah. And I'm not talking about a very uh, thin wire here. I'm talking about uh, deep sea fishing wire, which is a, a little bit thicker. All right. So, you know, obviously the coils will be uh, will have a, a, a some good spacing if we use that. And you can use different test lines. Of what what they call the diameter of the uh, the fishing wire. You can, can use. Ask, can I ask a quick question about this? Yeah. Uh, is your fishing wire textured? No. I w I would just use a a, a very very uh, cheap um, plastic fishing wire that you get from any of the fishing stores. Okay, if it's plastic, as as long as it's it's significant. If in that case. As long as it's significantly softer than the copper, you're gonna, you're okay. You're just gonna have control issues. Um, yeah. If it's harder than the copper, it's gonna actually gall up the copper really bad. Yeah, I, I understand. That's why I said the fishing wire because it's a soft. It, it's soft. It's basically plastic. So or, uh, or a cheap plastic, uh, good for uh, tennis uh, rockets. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, having a little loop a around it, high end. Having a, a loop of that stuff. Uh, around it held on with a pair of pliers and you run it down the coil like the guy did with the other piece of wire. Um, if you try both systems, you're going to find that just running it a second time over the coil is going to be infinitely less trouble. You might be right. So, anyway, there are different methods and uh, I'm very glad and very happy to see so many people contributing with their own ideas. So this all became now a uh, big global uh, um, how to say uh, the contribution work. Yeah, it's yeah, very I mean, interesting. Uh, your ideas are great. Uh, if you got an idea, try it. Um, I've been doing uh, manufacturing processes for over 20 years and I can usually, somebody will bring up an idea and I can see where it's gonna go wrong right away. That's why I got paid so much. Um, but you may have a solution that I don't see. So if you have an idea, try it. I mean, it's either gonna work or it's not. That's one or the other. Yep, lots of ideas, guys. We need to wrap things up here because we need to take a break before the um, uh, workshop begins in an hour. So um, let's just wrap up our final thoughts here. Yeah, Rick gets his 20 minutes of sleep a day. That's the only time any chance he gets. <laughs> I won't be sleeping either. <laughs> but yeah, it'd be nice to. Um, yeah, so. You can eat the You can eat the copper. You don't sleep, Rick? Um, I generally sleep. Um, I, I figure now when I, when I have a new technique where since we have um, two sides of our brain, the left brain, right brain, I let my left brain sleep and my right brain work for a while. And then I let my right brain sleep and my left brain work for a while. works fine. But I just look, I just look a little dozy. I just look a little dozy half the time. The body to recover. Well, I haven't quite perfected the technique yet. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate your input there, and uh, um, Phoenician, and uh, well, everybody. It's uh, great having input from everyone, uh, Annabelle, and so on. It's it's great when people all pitch in and. Uh, we're not uh, holding back at all. We're ready to not tear each other apart, but tear into the, the idea to see if there's some substance there and sort of penetrate it and so on. That's uh, that's great fun. So the more we can do that, the better. And, uh, Thanks, fellas. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Just one final tip, uh, because uh, many people had issues with different kind of uh, thickness of wires. 
for instance, in Europe, you have 1.4 millimeter thickness and 1.7 and none of uh, um, coating age. Uh, so that's why uh, my suggestion is uh, to check which uh, uh, wire thickness you have in uh, your walls and in your electric network and don't use any thicker like than that. It's no reason to oversize it when to have a bottleneck when you connect it. So if you see that your fuses, uh, if you have a 10 amps or 10, 16 amps fuse, it means you have a 1.5 square millimeter wire, so no need to use for the 2.5 square millimeter uh, wire. Yeah, I wouldn't go um, any thinner than um, 14 gauge probably if you're going to be running 2,000 uh, um, watts through it and so on, because that's... Actually for 2,000 watts, uh, uh, ah, you have a low voltage, you are in Canada, yes, uh, because that's you don't right. have 240 volts like yes. you have in, in uh, Central Europe. That means so the wire Central size... Europe can go thinner. That means the wire size has to be double for this um, for this area to to take the same amperage in it. So that's a big consideration, actually, that we haven't really thought about. Coils here should be double the size of the ones in Europe, in a sense. No, they are just right, just, just right. So fourteen gauge. Is well, yeah, very good. Well, for three, three, four kilowatts. Don't worry. Yeah, true. It for should be able to handle uh, for two kilowatts uh, for sure. For I think two it's kilowatts is good for, good the for about twelve amps. I think it's rated for fourteen gauge. If I'm not correct, if I'm yeah. not wrong. So yeah. you multiply uh, that uh, amps. Uh, 12 with how much is your voltage 110 right and it's not up to and you multiply with uh, uh, cosinus fee factor of, uh, 0 0.8 uh, so uh, for one kilowatt is no problem yeah it will be like 1.4 because that's a rms a 110 rms yeah there's no correction is is uh, the amperage uh, and, times the, the and the amperage might be more like 15 amps for a 14 gauge wire as well i think um, I'm not clear and i think the 16 gauge will take up to 10 amps or so yeah 14 gauge it's enough for low voltage system for about uh, one and a half kilowatts right yeah i'm sorry Sandra. i did have one question for you about the diameter of your coils the inside and the outer uh, and how you came up with that equation again? Uh, with, uh, just a second, I have to share my video. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into another five yeah, or yeah, 10 sorry. minutes okay. here. Well, I, I got to wrap things up. I need time. a break here. Okay, right. but, but you sorry, know, you could. I know you work hard, man. <laughs> you, you could give yes, to it. So this one, if, the, if this picture quick. tells you something, you can take a screenshot and watch later. Okay. So this is about um, six and a half inch uh, for the external uh, diameter of the um, larger coil, and the inter inner coil is just half of it in, in length. It's okay. Different. Okay. So this hey, all, uh, they look pretty, pretty, pretty good. Those are nice. Yeah. Very and this well, is all, is all spacing in. Yeah. 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 Beauty. Sandra, you could put 20 of those in a row. You could put 20 of those in a row. <laughs> Shut down, Rick. Breakfast time. Yeah, okay. Thank That's you, Rick. Sam Sandra, Sam Sandra. All guns, fellas. <laughs> All right, everybody. time to shut things down, guys. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. And uh, we'll see you next week. And I uh, hope to have some special things next week that we'll show. So we'll keep it a mystery until then. All right, it's the end of the Keshe Plasma Reactor Group for now it's Wednesday, November 4th, 2015. Bye for now. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Bye-bye.